Hi all and welcome to lecture 18 and for this lecture we are going to explore a little bit more some of these key concepts around extremism, radicalisation and terrorism. So what we're going to look at is a little bit more around what are they, think around actually are they the same but also to try and think around what some of those key differences are and how they can be approached and implemented and acted upon. So as I said in lecture 17, these are your three important concepts that we're going to spend some time always coming back to, thinking around, reflecting upon and thinking around in what context they will be reflected on and referred to. One of the things that I would say is when you're thinking around these terms, whether that's in the assessment that you've just done or if you are planning on thinking around this subject for the second assessment, you won't get criticised for using them because they are interchangeable, but actually it's about trying to understand some of those key fundamentals of what some of the key differences can be. So one of the things that I'm going to use is the European Institute of Peace. Uh, probably a bit different to think around in terms of some of the key texts that we may be pointing you to. But one of the reasons that I think the European Institute of Peace is important to consider is actually what the European element is and also to think around what we mean and we discuss when, if you think about in that first lecture, I spoke about the fact that we don't always get some key agreements around what terrorism is, for example. Uh, I've posted the link below of the EIP explainer, which is around understanding radicalisation. And for me, this is a really good one pager for any of you that are really interested in getting a bit of a key understanding of some of these terms that are simple, not too complicated, but makes you aware of how these things can be developed. So when we're thinking of radicalism, then it is about challenging that legitimacy. So thinking around some of these key words, legitimacy of established norms and policies. So I was always really interested in criminal justice. And one of the reasons that I became a probation officer, so for those of you that have met me before already know some of this, but my role before coming to the university was as a probation officer. And one of the things that always has interested me about crime and especially around terrorism is around why we have an established set of norms and values and policies and why some people adhere to them and some people don't and what some of that legitimacy is about. As the quote says from the European Institute of Peace is, not having an agreement or being a challenge to those views doesn't lead to violence in itself, but it's about having those dialogues. And we can think around radical communities. Are they being grounds for violent extremism or are they about prevention? Actually, it's really important. So for me, having this understanding that there will be some of you that are sat in this room that will have quite radical views about some things. Uh, and I give you an example of a view currently that I hear a lot is around the use of the death penalty. And some people would say that's quite radical. Uh, I don't think we should bring the death penalty back, I should say that. But there are a growing, growing number of people that think we should, especially for offences like extremism or terrorism. But actually having that view doesn't mean that I am I or those people are going to go out and bring that back or commit offences that lead people into being killed for the behaviour, etc. So it's about understanding that having views or rejecting values of society doesn't mean that you will commit an offence, but it can be about actually challenging those views and the laws of society. So it's really important to think around actually being radical for some people and some critics is about that understanding of the beginning of then turning into being extreme. So what we mean by that is thinking about how it's a continuum. So if we reflect on that continuum from the start in the last lecture, we can think that actually having radical views can start you on this continuum and it can lead on to having views that then turn into extremism that then can turn into thinking around how that can lead on to action that then could lead on to violent extremism or terrorism. So now we have looked at what radicalism is. Let's think about what that means in terms of being radicalised and what radicalisation is. 
So having been had or thought something radical or had a radical idea, Borum, who was cited in English 2011, uh, talked about the fact that having a radical view and moving on to that radicalisation process has these two requisites. So it's talking about having exposure to extremist communications uh, and actually being accepting of an ideology from that communication and talks about emanating that acceptance. So we think about someone who might have got a radical view. So if we take an example of somebody in Rotherham, who at the time when the child sexual exploitation uh, issue occurred and was brought to the public's attention, there was a large number of white males aged between 24 and 30 who made the decision to join the English Defence League. And part of that was due to that radicalisation process because they were exposed to a number of communications from the extremist uh, English Defence League who talked about the issue of Asian tax drivers in Rotherham being responsible for child exploitation. They were exposed to that rhetoric from the English Defence League and there was an acceptance of that ideology. So what we will talk about next week when we're thinking about right and left wing is what can make somebody susceptible to radicalisation. So what are some of those thoughts? How does that acceptance emanate from those communications? And we talk about that being a process of developing that extremist ideology and belief. So if any of us think around labelling theory, actually, if you hear something so often, you believe it. And radicalisation is a very similar process. So it's about going through that process of believing something, but being exposed and accepting of that. Uh, so thinking around actually some of those things that you will hear from a right wing rhetoric, which can be around the fact that uh, in Rotherham, it was about tax drivers being involved in child expo exploitation. If we think about some of the Brexit rhetoric around immigration, it's about people coming in, taking our jobs, et cetera, et cetera. That is around that radicalisation process. Again, thinking around this process in this continuum, being radicalised or being involved in that radicalisation process, again, doesn't mean that you go on to commit action and go on to take action. Thinking around that, that lead to action, it doesn't mean you will be violent and actually supporters of a radical ideology aim for deep radical changes in society. Only that small minority is willing to use or condone violence for those ends. So one of the things that we'll talk about next week when we look at right wing is those people that got involved in marching. So if you think around or have seen some of the pictures and we'll look at a clip next week around this, some people who were involved in English Defence League marches were ex-football hooligans who were banned from football matches. So due to their behaviour at football grounds, they were in receipt of football banning orders. And because they were bored on a Saturday afternoon when a lot of English Defence League marches took place, they decided to join that. Did they have some of the views? Did they become more radical in their thinking around some of those English Defence League beliefs? Of course they did, but they were not part of the major they were part of the major group, but they weren't part of that small minority willing to use or condone violence. So again, just to reiterate that point, if there's any of you sat listening to this at home thinking, well, I've got quite radical views about something, that doesn't mean that you're going to go on to commit an offence. Please don't worry. I have quite radical views on lots of things, but that doesn't mean that I'll take action. So then going further on that continuum, extremism. So what we mean is, and what we think it's different is it is about accepting violence as a legitimate means for obtaining political goals. And it doesn't actually mean that extremists get involved in that violence themselves. So it's about those leaders, those people of those groups creating this us versus them thinking. So it's this us versus them mentality. It can be about being closed off. It's about getting like-minded individuals together and it's about making people feel that violence is allowed. It's a way to alienate an individual from society. 
it's about marking an important stage in which individuals can become psychologically prepared to use violence. So it's different from just being radicalised because it's about actually thinking that there's a reason for you doing it. It's about the fact that going on a march, being violent, committing acts is the right way to go about things. It's about actually knowing that regardless of the fact that within society, committing that violent act or moving from peaceful protest into protest that is against the law is a process, but it's allowed. And that those people within your groups will allow that and will be motivated by some of that. And we'll look at some of those examples next week when we think about those two groups and those two different areas of about how they prepare and commit extremist acts. So we think around it in more detail. So extremism has those two elements. It can be about speech. So again, it's about that dissemination of it. That can be in writing, it can be intentional or incidental. Uh, when I worked in Barnsley, we had a major issue within the probation office of some groups trying to basically deliver hate speech. So on a Saturday afternoon, the National Party and the English Defence League had a stall within the town centre and they would be talking about their plight, what it was, but they would also be handing leaflets out. So it's thinking around actually those elements of speech and it's thinking about, if we think around, and I will use Hitler as the example, he was, a, he was seen as a charismatic leader, whether we agree or not, that's not condoning what happened, but there is a reason why he was involved and he was a leader of the Nazi party. He was able to get his message across. He was able to radicalise people to that view and he was able to speak and bring people across. And that is why some people would see him as a charismatic leader, an extremist or a terrorist. I will leave that up to you guys to think around. We then move from extremism into extremist terrorism. And this is where extremism and terrorism cross over and can be talked as the same or as different or in two different areas. And extremism and terrorism can have that overlap because what extremist terrorism is around is around those who are radicalised, uh, acting upon their beliefs and causing physical harm to people or collateral damage. What we would tend to class left and right wing views as is within the extremist category. They very, very rarely or haven't in the past gone on to widespread terrorism or terrorist acts. It is more those physical harm, collateral damage or extremist acts that are acted upon. So this extremist ideology then, activities, beliefs, attitudes, feelings, actions, strategies of a character far removed from the ordinary is what Coleman and Bartoli talked about. One of the things to think about is, and the question posed on this slide is, but what is the ordinary? So an extremist can be someone who speaks or acts, and extremism can be the speech or the act. Uh, so Aitken had talked about an MP in the 2012, David Davis, who caused a row when he called plans to legislate gay marriage barking mad. I think it's really important, the reason why I've left that in, is just to think where we now are. And that was eight years ago. And that's about actually thinking around how somebody who speaks or acts and has that ability to be influential and how this rural identification is important and how this Tory MP was in a position where he shouldn't have been speaking, but actually he could have been seen as having quite extreme views, uh, views that are outside of the ordinary thought, but actually coming back to having this question about what is ordinary. So when we think about extremist ideology, what's really important to consider is about what society classes as right and wrong, what society does to regulate views, and how society perpetuates that need to regulate views. So again, something to think around. And one of the tasks that we're going to look at next week uh, within the seminar is thinking about what we class or how society sees extreme views as being perpetuated or what we think they can be. So moving this then on back to this continuum. So we've worked our way from that radical and being radical all the way up now to this idea of terrorism. We talked in the last lecture about this idea of fear. Uh, I've put in brackets it's contested because I think it's really important to think about what we class as fear and what I may be fearful of 
could be very different to what someone else is fearful of. So I'll give you a personal example and please don't all judge me on this one. After 9-11 happened, I was very, very fearful around flying. I had a massive fear around flying and leaving the country and had this idea around what society had stereotyped about the people that were causing the offences after 9-11. So when we talk about Islamic and uh, extremist, which is extremism, which is religiously motivated, we will think about how the media talks about those from the Islamic faith. I was very fearful of someone from a Muslim or Asian background who would be on their mobile phone as we were still waiting for taking off. That fear for me was probably compounded by how society had reacted to things, but actually was contested. And if I look back now, I realise that it was ridiculous. Uh, but thinking about how that fear is developed, but the issue around what makes extremism and terrorism very different is around this use of serious weaponry and explosive devices. So it's about this loss of life. It's serious violence or harm. Uh, it's about this personal and collateral damage, but it can also be psychological, financial and physical harm. So thinking around those areas. And again, some of this can be contested. But the biggest difference around terrorism and extremism is about this word of using deliberate, because it's about thinking around what those deliberate acts are. Deliberate acts and deliberate disregard for harm and personal safety. So the objectives of terrorism, if we look at what Crenshaw talked about in 2014, is around this gain of recognition or attention. So that may be recognition or attention from publicity. That could be gain, gaining recognition or attention from your community, from other communities, from different groups. It could be about making a stance. It's about this disruption and discrediting of government activities. So when we think about the attack on London Bridge and the disruption, it's about having to destabilise the government. So when we think about some of the attacks that have then led to the risk level and the threat level of terrorist activities happening, that destabilises the government and, and destabilises society. So thinking around that object. Public attitudes and impact in public attitudes. We think about some attacks that have either invoked sympathy, they can invoke fear, but also we have attacks that have actually invoked anger. So thinking around those, but it's about also then getting this counter-terrorism reaction for, from the government. So asking them having to react, making this reaction needed. But what it also does from this object of terrorism is get this group morale. So that's about that internal group being able to sustain or build that momentum. And when we think around terrorism acts and think around what happens, it's about attempting to create this fear, this momentum that actually then dislodges the status quo within society and thinking a lot around those areas. Again, moving on some of those key elements, then thinking around it. So Richardson again and Crenshaw did some work around what some of the key elements can be. So we've talked about the different motivations. So it's, it's generally political, religious or ideological motivated. I think one of the things to think about, which we will look a lot about in the next couple of weeks, is this idea of ideology and how that ideology can be developed, but also can be impacted upon and what does impact on that. It also involves threatening or achieving violence and harm. It can be committed by state or non-state actors. So thinking around, it can be committed by people that are in this country, it can be committed by those that are coming into the country, it can be committed by British born or not British born, it can be committed by a number of different people and different factors. Uh, what's really important, I think, for you to also consider, and for those of you that are thinking around sex violence and extremism as a, as a whole, is this idea of media and social media and how that builds this picture of fear and intimidation, but also fuels some of our stereotypes within society. And we're going to do a task as a seminar group together around some of those ideas around what does social media and the media influence on some of those areas. I think it's important, and these last three points is 
it's important to remember that it's not just about one religion or group it's not just a post 9 11 occurrence and it has existed for centuries one of the important things to think about is i i had to and was delivering home office training to probation officers and police officers for about four years uh, around the prevent agenda which we will talk about in the coming weeks and one of the things to remember is yes a lot of the focus was on uh, al-qaeda inspired and islamic religious inspired terrorists because at the time that presented the biggest risk to our country and internationally however it's really important that we don't forget that there's more than one group and more than one area hence the fact that we're going to spend some time thinking about left and right wing extremism it's also important as this point says it has existed for a number of years one of the things to think around and one of the ideas that then also builds on this idea of why people go on to commit offences which i hope really does help you in understanding how grievance builds how the idea of radicalization extremism to terrorism occurs is the work that mong handam did in 2005 uh, american psychologist uh, and he talked about the staircase to terrorism again i've put the link to the paper on here but this staircase to terrorism i think is a really good example it's about this increase of anger or frustration and you can see starts at the ground floor and builds up and thinking around actually this perception of unfairness and why why it's happened what is that unfairness so if we think around that we will talk a lot more about this idea of vulnerability we'll talk about this idea of uh, grievance so why people get aggrieved but then you have to build that up so then that's about considering your options so in this we talk about capability we think about what people can be capable of but then building up to that search for a target so what is that group who are they angered with what's that perception of unfairness how what how do the options build so again you're building up these steps building up these areas to it go with and then as we get to three as you can see here ground floor first floor second floor actually are all pretty individualized so again, this is about thinking about those people that may be vulnerable to being radicalization, because as we get to that step three, it's about this engagement with morality of terrorist organizations. That engagement, that technology, that ability, that seeking out will be really important when we think around actually how do you de-radicalize and how do we catch people within that system? The consolidation of us versus their mindset and then these acts. Monkham talks about this need that you have these stairs to terrorism, but actually that doesn't mean that you can't stop people moving up those levels. It's a staircase, you can move up and down, actually depending on what that intervention is, what can happen. What they would also think about is the fact that you don't necessarily miss steps, but actually that process may be very quick in terms of moving from ground floor to their engagement with organizations so again hopefully what you've seen is the continuum of what we've talked about in terms of the definitions but this staircase is another visual aid that i think is really nice to think around how that can happen but then thinking again as i've said is that terrorism can be seen as a social construction uh, we come back to this idea of one man's terrorist is the other man's freedom fighter uh, and thinking around actually as we said in the last lecture that actually there isn't a universal agreement of what terrorism is and Schmidt in 2004 again talked about that and about the fact that it is a social construction and dependent on who's defining what terrorism is depends on what their interests are and Walker 2014 talked about the labeling something terrorism can achieve political objectives agenda and damning political opponents so when we think about how politics impacts those understandings, it's really important to think about that. Again, post 9-11, we had this problematic religious ferment of terrorism uh, and a real split in terms of those who were Muslim terrorists versus non-Muslim attackers. And actually those that were non-Muslim attackers thinking around their mental illness, thinking about learning disabilities, thinking about whether they were stable, but also 
during that period of 9-11, post 9-11, sorry, we have had this right of the far the rise of the far right, which is what we're going to spend some time looking at next week. So then thinking around this isn't trying to say that terrorist acts haven't happened, but actually how has the social construction of them influenced either the speed of what's happened or the opportunity influence of the occurrences. Take you back then to the UK government uh, definitions and the Terrorism Act definition. But what I've also put in there is the UK government prevents strategies definition of radicalisation. So we went through the definition of extremism last lecture. So I'm not going to repeat that. But then thinking around actually this is legislatively what we work with within the UK. So those three definitions. It may be really useful for you to spend some time comparing what those say to what we've gone through previously. So thinking and reflecting upon that, but also looking at what are some of the key words framing and actually how that happens, what influences it. I think what's really important as well is, and I think in the current context, things have changed. And I think you can reflect upon some of the additional wording of the legislation as different attacks have happened and we'll try and have a look at some of that in the coming weeks. So thinking around and just trying to move this on before we get into the specific groups is trying to think around some of the theories to what causes extremism. You'll see on here that I've tried to leave the colours as we did from the lectures previously. So green around religious and Islamic, blue around far right and racist, and your red around left wing utilitarian. So you will see here are some examples of what are some of the causation factors around extremism. So if we think around psychology, actually we can look a lot around identity and psychological distortion and disorder. And we'll think about some of the thinking around how that can be influenced, what are some of the influences on that, how that can be developed, and actually what are some of the problems then with attempting to address something that is psychologically distorted and how difficult that can be. So from a sociological point of view, we've got a lot there from normal sociology, thinking around subcultures and peer influences, and that is in all three. Uh, I know probably is in there, but I would definitely say there's something around culture and peer influence that goes across this idea of extremism. You've got the political issue. So thinking around political power and immigration are de definitely for far right, but also then thinking around the economic impacts on some of these areas and power dynamics. But also then moving on to the next column, some of the areas around sociological and social movements. So anti-rights, freedoms, pro-rights, freedoms, and we'll look more in detail of some of the literature and some of the examples of those as we get into the groups. Conflicts. A lot of the causation factors would say that conflict is needed for there to be a movement from extremism to terrorism. Uh, but actually, those people who look at lone wolf and those individuals who become involved in terrorist incidents would say that psychology has more of an impact. But thinking around those conflicts, they can be racial, sexual, religious, thinking around the conflicts about rights and freedoms, but actually thinking around actually how those conflicts manifest themselves, but actually then what some of the socio-political and economic impacts and responses are to those conflicts. Finally, environmental. Uh, environmental, thinking around some of the areas of green criminology, which we'll think around. Thinking around, especially now, some of the movement in terms of animal rights, animal testing, uh, the rise of vegetarianism and veganism, not saying it's a bad thing, but actually some of that has led to some of the environmental rights movement being a lot more stronger. From a right wing point of view, we think around actually immigration, how that's impacted social aid, but also the environmental identity of those areas. These are some examples. We will touch on more of these, but some examples if you want to think around what are some of the causation factors. But again, we'll go into some more detail over the coming couple of weeks. Social movement theory, then just thinking around that based on social mechanical solidarity, so thinking around some of the work of Durkheim again, 
thinking about those opinions and beliefs in a population and thinking about social structure and or reward distribution of society. Uh, Haywood describes it as a collective body distinguished by a high level of commitment and political activism, but often lacking clear organisation. Uh, so it's thinking about how things can be influenced, thinking about how things can move forward, thinking around how movement can develop and also thinking around actually how opinions and beliefs in a population can differ. So the social movement of my generation will be very different to the social movement of, let's say, your generation. Uh, and that's quite stereotypical, but thinking about some of the Gen X, Y, millennials, all that type of discussion has an impact and an influence on what social movement theory is. Interestingly, when we look at a lot of the social movement theory literature around English Defence League, we think about the typology and the age demographic and placing of people that get involved in right wing EDL, and they all seem to be the older generation uh, or those that are younger that have had influences from elder relatives who want to get involved in that movement. So something to think about. So let's return back to the three types and thinking around again this racist islamic utilitarian just again that referral back to those three types i'm not going to go over them because we went through them in the last lecture but just bringing us back just to remember some of those areas extremism or terrorism then what you'll see on screen at the moment are a number of acts and bear these acts in mind because these will bear some of the discussion that we will have and some of the tasks that I'm going to get you to do for the uh, seminar next week. Uh, so the seminar, which will be live the week commencing the 23rd of March and think around actually, where would you put these on a continuum? So thinking around cause fear of serious harm, I would hope you would be looking at the fact that we would class that as terrorism. So thinking around that, thinking around how that can be viewed. To compare that to rarely cause a direct danger to life, we would class that as extremism. You will find that there will be some of these on here that would be on a continuum in terms of action, but actually can still also be potentially in the middle. But we will come back and visit these in the seminar that will go live week commencing 23rd of March. So just then to think around some of the areas that we're going to touch upon in the next coming weeks. Uh, Tools of the trade potentially may feel a bit odd to talk about, but actually it's just about trying to think around what are some of the actions that people may be cause, committing, causing, and actually how some of these can veer them from extremism into terrorism. Uh, I think what's also interesting, and when we reflect upon some of the more serious incidents that we're going to talk about, actually most of the things that you can see here on screen are all available to any of us in the community. So actually, if we think about nails and screws, for example, go to your local warehouse, B&Q, etc. You don't get asked about how many packs you buy, for example. So thinking around this, it's really important to think around some of those areas. Uh, really important to think about that. Uh, petrol, again, uh, the note at the top about writing, uh, we will come back to when we're thinking about left wing. Uh, and the impact of writing malicious communications to a lot of animal rights extremists uh, or agencies have been impacted by that. And then the idea of free speech or that hate preaching, whatever line you want to think around. Uh, and we'll come back to reflect on some of these in the coming weeks. So just then to bring in some of the information around publications then, and I'll come back to some of this. The Terrorism Act 2000, Section 58, talks about the fact that it's illegal to download and store and or print some materials. Uh, and actually, interestingly, how this has changed over the past 20 years in the fact that it's also having to apply to material viewed repeatedly or streamed online. Defense of reasonable excuse for legitimate viewers, so academics, journalists, etc. It's really important, and the reason I've included this in here is please do be careful if you are searching for materials related to this subject. Uh, yes, they will look. Yes, you will be tagged in terms of what you're looking for. Uh, so if there is something that you are particularly interested in or you want to know about, please, 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 can we talk about how uh, 
you are searching for things. So just bear in mind that it can be quite tricky. Uh, if you search how to make a bomb, then you will be flagging up on the system, just to put it out there. So to end this section and to get you to think around some of these areas, and before we then move next week into thinking about the groups and the different areas and organisations, I've put a link to a 12 minute YouTube clip, uh, which has been done. It was 2017, so two, three years ago, and by Erin Marie Saltman, who discusses the push and pull factors that cause people to join extremist groups and explains innovative ways of preventing and countering radicalisation. What I hope this will do is give you an idea about a group of people, young people who are susceptible and can be vulnerable to extremist groups. And the 12 minutes should give you a really good idea around how they are radicalised and recruited. 12 minutes shouldn't obviously give you too much stress to listen to and to think about. What I'd like you to do is think around what are some of the push and pull factors that she talks about, but actually what are some of the things that are talked about in terms of prevention and counterism, countering that radicalisation approach. So please do take the time either at this moment now to watch that video uh, or actually after I'll post that, the uh, link is on the PowerPoint and the PDF versions that you'll be able to access. So please do think about what we can do in terms of watching that 12 minutes. What we're then going to move on to for next week is you will get the right wing and left wing extremism. So viewpoints, we're going to spend some time specifically looking at those groups and those differences. And what I will hopefully do over those two lectures is give you some really good examples, give you some of the theory and literature, but also give you some videos to engage with, which will give you a good idea in terms of those views. Again, references are available. Any questions or queries about the material for this lecture, please do get in contact. And I hope you've enjoyed engaging with these two lectures.